I love that we've been able to defy people's expectations. Um, you know, I knew we had to hit like as hard as humanly possible. Not that I ever want to do less than my best, but the idea of coming back with this relaunch and people assuming, well, you just wrote it at Marvel. We know what you do. We know what your Conan looks like and sounds like. And, and I had to be like, oh yeah, check this out. <laughs> Hey, you Stygian dogs. Welcome to another installment of Conan's Compatriots. I'm very pleased to present a conversation in two parts with the one and only Jim Zub. Jim is the writer of the critically acclaimed monthly comic book series Conan the Barbarian from Titan Comics and Heroic Signatures. Something that stands out in this conversation is Zub's gratitude and enthusiasm, not to mention a possibly superhuman work ethic. Here in part one, we speak about Howard Day's fearlessly pitching for the gig, his work at Marvel, the Savage Sword of Conan, including his recent prose story and a new battle poem that will be appearing in issue number three, plus so much more. And trust me, you won't want to miss part two, where we get into what to expect from Free Comic Book Day and the Battle of the Blackstone miniseries event, issues 13 to 16, and some exclusive details on issue number four of The Savage Sword of Conan. Before all of that, we get into things by chatting about the busy convention circuit. I love um, hearing from people that they're excited about the book and excited about our favorite, you know, uh, our favorite Sumerian. Yeah, it's the, it's awful, the best. You've been awfully busy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. For the convention circuit, I mean, that obviously keeps you busy. I mm -hmm. assume it feels like work, but it's fun. But is there a point where it does just feel like work? Um, I mean, it, it's great. Okay. I never want to talk. Um, I never want to make it sound like I'm not appreciative because it is a lot of fun. Yeah. The, the experiences that I've had over the years, getting to travel, getting to go to places, getting to meet readers and sort of put a real face to a name. If I've talked to people online or just, you know, celebrate in general, the, the work that's being done and that people are really reading this stuff. I, um, I never, ever want to sort of take that for granted. The difficult part is when you're trying to balance that against a really intense production schedule and that's you know right now depending on how you want to measure it i'm i'm writing sort of like five different conan scripts in various stages of development right so right. some of them are are issues that are getting ready to go to press and other issues are you know i'm finalizing dialogue and i'm pitching new stories um it's where i want to be it's my favorite thing and i'm having an absolute blast with it so again it's just a matter of when you look at the calendar and you're booking one of these trips and you sort of go, oh yeah, that's five months from now, things will, that's going to be so great. And then you actually get closer and closer and you go, oh my gosh, I've got so many deadlines and we got that, you know, my wife and I talk all the time and she's like, the calendar is not Tetris. You don't have to fill every single block, <laughs> you know, and uh, it gets a little wild at times. I am actually taking a vacation in May. Oh, nice. And so my current kind of um, sprint is getting ahead on everything that I have on the big schedule so that I can step away for a good three weeks and um, relax and kind of celebrate the arrival, you know, of summer and, and, and dive into real, you know, con season with gusto, June and July and August in particular. Are, are you going to be at Fan Expo Toronto again? I am. Yeah. I'm going to be at Fan Expo uh, Toronto. I'm doing Fan Expo Chicago as well, which I haven't done before, um, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. I'm doing Howard Days in June, which is going to be incredible. Is that, and is that your first time for Howard Days? It is. And it's a little nerve wracking if I have to be 100% honest. Oh, and you know. you're nominated as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm nominated for it. You know, I tried to explain <laughs> to people about uh, to give people some context if they don't know how this stuff sort of works. So there's the, you know, the Robert E. Howard Foundation, which is separate from, you know, the rights uh, for the characters and stuff like that. And, and they've got a real literary bent and they don't nominate a lot of uh, comics. They don't nominate a lot of Conan comics. Um, I've never been nominated before and I've been writing Conan stuff off and on since 2015. So it's a really big nod. And, um, Jeff Shanks told me this one's pretty special because all the previous comic nominations have come from adaptations of Howard work. Right. And so getting, you know, bound in Blackstone in that same kind of category is a, it's a really big deal. And um, I'm very, very honored, you know, however it goes. Uh, and it, it feels good. It, it, it's exciting that people are so on board with what we're doing right now with the Titan run and with everything at heroic, it's just been, um, 
it's a joy, man. I don't know how else to put it. It's it, this is I keep saying it. This is where I want to be, and we're having a ton of fun doing it. And knowing where we're at right now, and the cool stuff that people have just read in like issue nine, and what's coming up, you know, ten, eleven, twelve, and into year two. It's um, <laughs> it's yeah, cool. It's it's uh, it's, it's fun. fun. I really enjoyed the last issue. I mean, Thank as you. I said in the review, it it had this open quality. It was a breather. Yeah um the exploration of the world it was just a nice change of pace they've all been excellent um, thank you but it's 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 going really well um yeah it's been cool do you like do you pinch yourself are you like this is real and these are the characters yeah um i you know i said at the end of of um last year i do like a year in review on my newsletter and i said it's hard to imagine not only does lightning strike twice, but you somehow catch it in the bottle on the second, you know, to mix my metaphors, like <laughs> that, that, that somehow I got to do my favorite thing again. And this is the one that really, really worked, you know, and that um, feels very, very special. And, and I owe a lot of that to uh, Fred Malmberg over at Heroic that he really saw, you know, the potential of what, we wanted to do and sort of what could be done and that we just had this ongoing conversation even after the marvel stuff was wrapping up that it was about he really looked and he said you know i think this guy's got the voice and i think he you know some of the things that we had even sort of talked about at marvel that we never got to or we weren't able to sort of see the full scope of that we could kind of come at it from a real fresh perspective and kind of go okay look at everything that's been done with the property over decades what works and what doesn't why why was this such a huge you know hit in the 70s why did it sell so well why was it one of marvel's top books and not that we can just do that again but try and really get to the through line and go what can we do in the here and now that can speak to a really vibrant audience what do i love about it yeah. what is you know all those things and and find the right creative team you know across the board someone like you know rob obviously uh de la torre and and doug braithwaite two phenomenal artists that are both bringing really amazing quality to the page and um trying to so, give them something worth drawing yeah something that i mean always stands out i think you mentioned it and i know i like to highlight it is it is a product of a team and absolutely and, and it's wonderful to celebrate that. It's nice to see you do For that. Sure. Um, I, you have to. The, the yeah. reality is, like, I've written a lot of comics um, over the years. And when the team is in sync, when the creative team is all pushing in the same direction, everyone is, there's a term. So I come from animation, and we would always use the term plussing. So because you would do design for a show and then you would do storyboards and then in the storyboard stage, you then have to do what's called layout and then animation. And you're taking the best qualities of the storyboards and then you're trying to really not just make smooth motion of those things, but to increase it. Once you get the voice acting, how are you syncing up that animation? That at every stage of this thing, you're trying to improve and improve and improve the final you know, film. And comics are are similar in that respect that we are trying to if the art doesn't speak to the qualities of the narrative then you either have to change those words or you have to figure out where those gaps are and um when the team's in sync man it it, it feels alchemical it feels really really cool and yeah, I, um, I i think the reader definitely yeah. gets that too um, absolutely and, and the, yeah. the, the energy that we're trying to put into it I think our exuberance comes through. I know that that's definitely true across yeah. the board. Um, evident too is is kind of the long term planning. Um, yeah, like when you sat down. So I'm just imagining how does it work, Jim? You know, <laughs> come along on this ride with us. Is it a sure. matter of like sitting down? Like Fred gives his vision. Um, it, it seems obvious to me that that Jeff Shanks has had input. In, in oh, he, though, perhaps? Jeff is our secret weapon. Yeah. <laughs> I say to so many people, you know, Jeff has got such deep wells of knowledge. Like I have excitement and I feel like I am, I'm becoming more and more knowledgeable in all things Robert E. Howard as this journey goes along. Yeah. But I didn't fully appreciate, you know, the extent and the depth and the breadth of, of the literary source material of 
the vast, you know, kind of, of genre depth of his work, of the poetry, of everything involved in it. I, you know, I love Conan the Barbarian and I love Sword and Sorcery. And that was always evident, you know, in the work. But when we came on board and again, it was like, let, let me roll it back because you asked me how it sort of started. And I think that answering that kind of leads us to a bunch of these other sure. things, right? Yeah. So, you know, things are are wrapped up at Marvel. And they're, um, one of the things that Fred told me was that they were looking at bringing everything in-house. That they felt like, you know, Conan has been a comic book staple for 50 years. And that they had uh, the ability to sort of develop something in-house and take it to a publisher rather than looking for a licensing deal. And that meant incurring costs internally rather than just, hey, let's you know find a publisher that's going to give us money. But that they felt that the property um, you know, deserved that and that they wanted to have a stronger kind of hand on the wheel. And because I had you know, at Marvel, I proposed a bunch of different things and I had been talking with Fred ongoing um, just in general about the character and about the property. He comes from a tabletop gaming background. I obviously big in that space as well. And so we just had a lot of shared DNA as far as that stuff goes. And so he had sort of said, you know, blue sky, like what would you do if you just had a fresh tack on this thing? And how would you look at it? And what do you keep? And what do you, you know, throw away? And what do you, what do you laser focus? And so I talked to my wife and I said, well, this is crazy. They're, they're doing a bake-off with multiple writers who are going to be proposing stuff. I'm the guy that just did it at Marvel. I'll never get it again. I, you know, I, I'm shocked he's even asking me. Right. And she goes, well, then fearlessly, <laughs> you know, pitch because you, it's not yours to, to have. And so I kind of just really went to town. I, I put together a couple of different documents about big picture stuff. Really uh, a couple of documents about the character, about the world, and then about sort of not even a publishing plan so much as like a, a like a sky high view of, of the genre and what Conan represents to that and how you present the Hyborian Age to a new readership. Right. And, you know, Fred responded really well to it and said that, you know, he would be in touch and then kind of came back and said, you know, we, we think you're the guy for this. And I was genuinely kind of shocked. And because of the nature of comic publishing in the year 2023, it was like, who knows how the market's going to respond to this thing. Yeah. They had started putting together the deal with Titan. And I essentially said, I think we can do these cool things, but you and I both know this might not work. Like the market just might not respond no matter all of our best intentions. Yeah. It sounds good to make huge long-term plans, but man, when Marvel has to, and DC have to hit the reset button, it feels like once a year on a bunch of their, even their, the, some of their bigger books, it, it feels pretty audacious to assume that we're going to be able to just roar out of the gate and do whatever we want. And so I put together a 12 issue let's, you know, hit it into overdrive, do as many of the big cool things that we can to sort of establish a foundation. And if those 12 are all we get, it's a really cool epic adventure. And you'll still see that over the course of these 12 issues that we're right. doing, you know, that 12 is not the end. And whenever I get messages from people where they're like, oh, I hope you stick around after 12. And I'm like, oh, that's no longer really a, a concern. Um, but that those 12 are sort of a unit of, I don't want to say like make it sound really cold, a unit of entertainment, but those are like a satisfying epic kind of quest. And yeah. it all involves the Blackstone stuff um, and what may have you. And there's some, you know, we don't answer every question because that's not the nature of sword and sorcery anyways, right. particularly for a character like yeah. Conan, but, but that we're going to give you a really cool, awesome thing for, for one year worth of comics. And hopefully people see what we see and people believe what we've got and then we're going to be able to to go bigger and go longer term and we have that plan as well right and the numbers on issue one were crazy obviously for titan and they were amazing numbers just in in comic publishing in general and then as always issue two you see a large drop off because of variant covers and it's not a new series and then we've been steadily climbing pretty much ever since and and proving ourselves 
that there's a substantial readership that they're sticking around and what may have you. And the minute that we got to, I would say, you know, the end of Blackstone, so issue four, and the numbers were stellar. It's like, okay, the plan is now the plan. Like we can finally build this thing out and start to put down real milestones and pillars moving forward. And so those 12 are still in that original proposal and we're delivering on them almost identically to what I said we were gonna do, but we can foreshadow bigger, more amazing things. We can do cooler stuff across the board. And Fred, you know, it sounds weird, but his mandate has always been like, the comic is the the workhorse. You can do a movie once a generation. You can do a video right. game every five or six years. You can do whatever board game stuff every couple of years, a novel once a year. The sharp tip of the spear on the property is the monthly book. It's what people see most steadily. If it's good, it makes everyone feel good about Conan and they know there's clarity on the vision of that character. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I take that very seriously in terms of what people see and that we are at the front of this really amazing, cool, you know, new push in terms of this publishing initiative. And so I have to make that as strong as we can make it and sort of set the pace for all this other stuff that that's in the hopper and, and prove to people that this character is viable and vibrant in the year 2023, 2024 and onward. And right. that is what excites me the most about it. And that's, what's been so cool. Um, hearing that other people, you know, are, are just as pumped as we are. Yeah. I, I get a lot of, I get, I get a lot of messages too. That's what's really nice about doing the channel as, as the hobby that it is, but people respond well to it as well. And I, I get messages and actually um, there's a, a friend of the channel in South Africa, uh, Brendan mm -hmm. J. Jacobs. He is cool. an independent. He's an independent writer. He he wrote this mm -hmm. story, uh, Red Mane and the Scorpion's Kiss, uh, that he bases very much on sort of a, a property Howard uh, thing. Nice. Uh, and he has a question for you. He wanted okay. to know what is it, in your opinion, why why is it that Conan maintains his prominence, especially in sword and sorcery? where it's, I guess, a bit more of a niche genre versus sure. your, your high fantasy of, of Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I think that there's a the some of the most, a character becomes an icon because the core concept is so simple. And that doesn't mean simple like stupid. It just means like simple yeah. in terms of I can explain it to anyone and they get it right from the get-go, right? Conan is a survivor in a world, you know, of danger and mystery. Uh, he is this force of change. Wherever he goes, exciting adventure is going to happen. And that, at its core, is what it's all about. You don't need to know about the Thurian Age and the Hyborian Age. You don't need to know about different eras of the characters or repeating motifs or, or symbolism. That's my job, to put that yeah. into the story and to hopefully give people a greater appreciation over a longer span. But if you just drop in on an average issue of Conan the Barbarian, you're gonna know what's at stake, it's gonna be exciting as hell, and hopefully the art's gonna blow you away. And that's kind of, um, that's the job. That's why the character works and why it functions well. It's why a character like Batman or Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman or any iconic character if you if you distill them down to that essence and you do it well hopefully the fan base sees that and responds to it you know right. what i mean and so that's kind of um why i think conan sticks around is that we want he is aspirational in the sense of he's a character who survives and he explores and he pushes himself out into these spaces he is self-made in that sense you know and and he speaks to a lot of thematic qualities of Robert E. Howard, the writer, you know, the, the Texan kind of what a frontiersman sort of stuff that, that Howard wanted to be and wanted to exemplify in a lot of his work and in his characters yeah. and the kind of heroic character that we want to see ourselves as, as well, you know? Um, and then you put onto that, that, the potential of the sort of bigger mythic kind of things that he puts into those stories and the quality of his writing. And then you can see why out of 
hundreds of contributors to weird tales you know he, he and lovecraft and a couple others are the ones that stand out because right. the quality of the writing is so good the iconic quality of the character is so strong and um you know the the quality of the art i think without obviously something like the frank frazetta covers or the Barry Windsor Smith, you know, comics and John Buscema and all that kind of stuff that just continues to elevate and echo it forward. The quality of the John Milius movie as a, as a piece of entertainment, the soaring, you know, soundtrack, like all these things start to kind of form around this character as a bigger pop culture icon. Mm -hmm. And, and our job is to sort of say, okay, we're the next, you know, kind of link in the chain here. We're the next, whatever you want to call it, you know, we've got the baton right now and and we're running with this amazing cool thing and trying to show people how far we can go and and as far as that pop culture icon I mean, we had spoken briefly about it uh before we hit record what is your first memory of conan what what was the right. entry point for you what age what right so i was really young yeah. so for me it's a little hard to I can't remember if it was the books or the comics first. Um, okay. I know my brother was, he's a voracious reader. He's four years older than me. So I've got to be seven or eight years old and he's 12 and he just eats up books and he's constantly buying stuff from the used bookstores and borrowing things from the library. And I know for a fact that he had uh, probably the Lancer books um, you know, it, popping around and those iconic covers and everything else. But at the same time, there was constantly comics we were picking up. We would go to, um, you know, my family, we had a cottage uh, north of Peterborough here in Ontario. And when we would go up for the weekend, sometimes we would stop by the comic book shop or the used bookstore on the way to pick up things other times we would go to a flea market that was nearby on the weekend and we would just dig through old comic boxes and grab stuff and there was always conan comics and savage sword issues that were sort of strewn about in and amongst that stuff and so all of that kind of steeped into our love of sword and sorcery as we were starting to play dungeons and dragons and spoke to the kind of cool dark monster killing and treasure gathering kind of stuff that we were into there and then the Conan movie, um, we didn't see it in theaters. Obviously, I was way too young for that. But once it's on home video, we start to, my cousins I know rent that film and we rent that movie and watch it. And we were just awestruck because it felt like so many of the fantasy movies of that 70s, early 80s era, they feel pretty hokey. You know what I mean? They've, they've got a real... <laughs> kind of <laughs> low budget patina kind of going on there and and conan punches above its weight class like it it's got the cool heist it's got the personality it's infinitely quotable it's got a soundtrack that doesn't feel tinny or synthy yeah. it's very bombastic and rich yeah and it's, everyone it's still, is taking it seriously yeah. yeah it still holds up too i watched it just oh, a few totally. weeks a weeks ago with my son and it's still did a you pick up the arrow re-release did you pick up no the i have uh something i bought a couple of years ago just like okay new Ray. yeah the new arrow rest arrow uh restoration is, is good. stellar yeah the 4k is crazy <laughs> we watched ultra hd here on my big screen oh, yeah. had a bunch of friends over and we were just like you know, everyone knows those lines and everyone knows those moments. And yet everything, all the bridging bits, everything works really, really well. And it is, uh, it's still just thoroughly, thoroughly entertaining from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And, and obviously I look at it so differently now and you can nitpick and you can say, of course, it's not a good adaptation of, of Howard's Conan, but be damned if it's not just a thoroughly entertaining film from start to finish. And, and, if another Conan movie happens, say when, if, yeah. when, at some yeah. moment, it's got to happen. I hope it's as entertaining and as rich and closer to the source material, but that they look to that movie and understand why it has stuck around and yeah. why it it elevated the fandom and expanded the fandom and continues to do so. You know, the number of people that come to me that started with that movie is massive, obviously. You know? Yeah, I think for me it was definitely the movie uh, that 
brought Conan into the forefront of my mind. Sure. Like I know, I think I've referenced before uh, the airbrush vans back in the day. <laughs> Definitely, you know, there was just this omnipresent uh, sword oh, and yeah. sorcery, right? Uh, yep, and I yep. and I think the comic books, like I remember Savage Sword more, and I think in my head I was like. Conan well, those is, painted covers, right? Yeah, but right. I always think it was Conan is for the for the for the older boys. Right? Sure, that sure. Been, you know, like seven. Well, that's what made it like, like Forbidden yeah. Fruit, though. That's yeah. why I liked it because, particularly an issue of Savage Sword, it wasn't like a like a like a dirty porno magazine or something, but it had yeah. this quality of like, oh my gosh, it's going so far, it's pushing right. it, like the intensity of the violence and the also just the amount of pages of story you would get, you get one of those magazines and it's got essays in it and it's got multiple stories. And you're like, that's a, for a kid, that's like an afternoon's worth of entertainment. Cause you're just pouring yeah. over every drawing. You know what I mean? You're like letting it kind of really sink in. Yeah. And that's what was replicated so well with the new, the savage sword. Uh, you oh, really, thanks. you felt like you were getting something pretty special. Yeah. There. Something needy. I loved hearing across the board that people felt like, they couldn't believe how many pages they got for their seven bucks that yeah. that, that felt like the coolest thing that we could bring people was check out yeah. that heft of of entertainment for sure yeah i think patches Urker was raving about it too just in, in yeah. the, having the volume of it and the pro story your pro story was great man that thank was, you it was so enjoyable. Was, that was so stressful <laughs> was it i was gonna <laughs> it, ask it was it was it's one of the hardest things i think i've ever worked on especially when you think of the the page count versus the stress that i gave myself over it <laughs> yeah. like you know it's two pages in the final published three if we count you know the the reproduction yeah, of just goes yeah. joe just goes artwork i Amazing. just have to say that out loud yeah. let me roll a little bit back when we got our comp copies of savage sword and i crack open that box and i pull out a printed copy it was like a mental tug of war because it's a time capsule but my name's on the cover like right. that doesn't make sense um you know working with uh, Joe and and putting that whole thing together was such a mind bending experience because we're sending emails back and forth and he sends the rough over and we're talking about oh where are we going to set it because essentially he had the idea of course we're going to have a single figure and we're going to have a girl at his side and and you know the warriors he's slain kind of your classic Frisette and kind yeah. of imagery but he said we can put it anywhere we can put it in the north we can put it in you know wherever uh, whatever part of the highborn age you want. And I was sort of like, oh, geez, I guess it's up to me. And then we were talking about Stygia and wouldn't that be cool? And I haven't said a story there yet. Not really. And so let's do the classic, you know, let's do the desert and the big hot sky and all that kind of stuff. That'll, that'll work really, really well. And it's coming together. And then I'm, I've got to put this story together and I've got to be me. I've got to tell a story that works for me, but also just like with the comic itself, I want to celebrate the lyrical quality and the the power of the prose and and the verbiage that you know that two gun bob's got and so you're sort of reading and rereading and trying to sort of catch that energy like why does it sound that way and how punchy can we get it and and realizing that even though i've only got about three thousand words i think was the maximum they said they could give me right i've got to try and make a complete sort of bit of story and then i read I reread um, Frost Giant's Daughter and I did a quick word count on it and it's just over 3,100 words. And yeah. I'm like, well, damn. <laughs> look, look, look what, uh, just, you just know, Bob, something that good. Yeah, look what Bob does in 3,000 <laughs> words. No problem. Just do one of those. You know, yeah. Frost Giant's Daughter, just, just pop no out worries. one of those. And, um, but it was, it was a challenge. It was a challenge to sort of go, okay, you've got, it's one extended fight scene. That's, that's sort of the structure I gave myself. It's, yeah. it's, it's it's mood building and then it was in a, a series of attacks and a cool payoff and that's yeah. all you've got space for so how can you make every paragraph kind of hit and make it feel cool and yeah. and uh, you know really poured over every damn sentence of that thing um and in a way that i I don't think I've done on any script ever, obviously, this for comics because feel so, so naked once it's out. Oh there. yeah, I, I did like feel it. naked because you're <laughs> like, I don't have, I don't have these phenomenal artists covering all my inadequacies, you know, or whatever may have you. Or people attribute the best qualities of these comics to the writer, and sometimes it's just pure 
visual artistry that's coming across and making you look better than you ever could have imagined, you know? And sometimes the reverse happens. If you work with an artist and you're not in sync, you know, people are telling you the story's trash and you're like, well, that was, there was more in the script there, but <laughs> <Was you, it> me? <laughs> you'd never know, you know? And so you, 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 you take the shine when you can get it and you, yeah. you know, you, you shunt off the blows, whether or not they're warranted. But in this case, I knew it was like, oh, I'm just going to be compared to, you know, the source. Oh, good. How's that going to go? Um, but it was fun. It was fun to do. And I'm glad I did it. And I want to do it again. It's yeah. not something I want to, uh, throw myself out in the square every single issue, obviously, but it's yeah. it's definitely something I, I want to do. I've got a, another challenge coming that I know some of the literati are probably going to think is pretty audacious. Um, I was talking to Chris Butera and I sort of said, look, just for my own sake, I want to have stuff in every issue, if at all possible. You know, in issue two, I've got a the lead story with Richard Pace and it's, it's a lot of fun. I think people are going to really like it. It's a very different kind of a dark kind of Conan story. Uh, but issue three, originally I didn't have anything in there. And issue four is a whole different thing. And we're going to talk more about that once the solicits come out. Okay. But issue three, I was like, can I just like sneak in there with an essay or with like a little short story or something? Yeah. And we were going back and forth and they were like, man, the page count's getting really tight because everyone's got stuff in there. And so Chris lobbed it back to me and he goes, I want you to do a battle poem. And I was like, oh, nice. oh God. <laughs> Oh God, yeah, that's great though. <laughs> yeah, that, no stress at all, right? So, um, if I thought, if you thought I lavished time on a on a short story, trying to do prose like like poetry, lyrical, whew, I I um, tortured myself over uh, what is ostensibly a very small <laughs> bit of text, um, but I think it turned out really good. And uh, Delatore okay. is going to be uh, illustrating that. And nice. Yeah, I, I can't wait to. Yeah, I can't wait for that. It must be nice to stretch those muscles to try something new to prove to yourself yeah, too. I yeah, guess that you can yeah, do it. Good. The whole thing has been a challenge, you know. Yeah. Um, I love that we've been able to defy people's expectations. Um, you know, I knew we had to hit like as hard as humanly possible. Not that I ever want to do less than my best, but the idea of coming back with this relaunch and people assuming, well, you just wrote it at Marvel. We know what you do. We know what your Conan looks like and sounds like. And, and I had to be like, Oh yeah, check this out. And, <laughs> and, and, so? yeah. yeah. You know, like, let's see how much further we can go. And I, I, I need to, um, I need to bend the, the, the tone of history here. Cause I've mm -hmm. heard people say that, um, whatever marvel was censoring me or i was being given some mandate from on high that i had to do certain things because we were being published by marvel and i just want to like wipe that out that is untrue yeah. i got to do exactly the book i wanted to do at marvel when you read issue 13 and i'm doing the crucible or when you read um just any of the stuff serpent war any of those things those are my stories those are my words those are my scripts the amount of editing that we got was minimal uh, you know, Mark Basso, my editor at Marvel was phenomenal. Roja Antonio and Corey Smith and all the artists I work with were amazing. Okay. I just want to like, like yeah. clear the air completely on that stuff. I am writing the Conan. I, I, I wrote the Conan I wanted to write at Marvel and I'm writing the Conan I want to write now at Titan, you know, and at, at Heroic. And I think those stories, um, I really like them. I like the Crucible. I like, you know, uh, um, uh, Black Lotus and all the other stuff that we did there, but I was figuring stuff out. One of the difficulties in this publishing market right now is that there's no room for, it feels like for creatives to grow. Do you know what I mean? There is no yeah. mid list author who eventually becomes a bestseller. It's like, you have to come out of the gate, all killer, you know, no filler. And, and that's a really hard thing for people to do. And, I think in some ways, because I've been handed Conan and I was like, we slammed right into the pandemic and all that other sort of stuff. There's a nervous kind of energy and I don't know where I'm going with certain things. And I want to do a long run on this book. So I'm sort of like trying to do a marathon. So I'm sort of trying to stretch things out right from the get-go. And what I didn't fully appreciate was the fact that the comic market is so tumultuous and things are so crazy like i'm i was never going to get to the big stuff do you know what i mean and right. and because we're coming out now i was like oh yeah okay here's all the big crazy here's all that <laughs> and it's not to say that we don't have more 
big crazy to come because oh man do we ever but i knew that this second chance was we just shouldn't have even happened and so if i did anything less than explode on the page then we we were going to squander it you know yeah. and then rob's art and everything else so yeah the book i did at marvel i'm super proud of i think in many ways people are going back and rereading those stories and they're being um they're appreciating them more i think because they sort of look and they go oh these are kind of fun or oh these are pretty cool or oh there's some neat ideas here and there's a little bit of lyricism to some of the the captions like i'm 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 getting little sparks here and there and little bits of, of static electricity and now i feel like we're throwing lightning bolts you know so it's uh it's much I, different it's something that i've i've grown to love is finding just the the perfect alliteration that just <laughs> punctuates and <laughs> i love it i love it when, there's a moment where because i'm also writing the book differently like i was writing yeah. full script at marvel right so i would hand the the artist this is the number of panels. This is the the text, and that works for some artists, you know, really well. Um, you know, Dilatory wanted uh, he wanted this very freeform kind of approach, much like it was done back in the old days. You know, the way Roy Thomas would do it: you just write the outline, I give him as much inspiration and excitement as I can, and then he blasts out just unbelievable artwork on the page. And then I've got that artwork in front of me as I'm trying to summon the words to describe it. Right. And boy, does that inspire you <laughs> and intimidate you. And, and um, when it hits, you know, there's times when I've literally gotten up from my desk, I finished doing a, a section of lettering script as we call it. And I come down for dinner and my wife looks at me and she's like, you got a weird look on your face. And I'm like, there's something, there was, there was stuff crackling across the keyboard. That's all I can say. It was really, really fun and it's working. And, and I don't have a big ego about those things, but you know, when it works, you know, when you feel it, you know, or when I send a piece in and Matt or, or Chris, you know, responds and they're just like, Oh damn. Like, you know, that the artwork it's easy to tell you get it in your inbox and you're just freaking out like yeah. literally there are times when we would get stuff in the inbox and i would immediately phone um you know my editor and we just start swearing like that's the compliments are did you see it oh my god like we're all losing <laughs> our minds it's harder to to do that with the text to make people to get chills or whatever but when it works it works and right now man oh man is it working we've it's got working. some uh, it it it's a joy um and and you know richard starkings guy's a legend in the industry right like he's he helped pioneer a lot of the things we think of as digital comic book lettering and all that kind of stuff and we send excited messages back and forth you know and he wants to make it perfect and i think you really lettering is the invisible art form when it's working no one notices how damn good it is and how it's moving your eye through the page and how it's focusing your attention in all the right spots but if it's done poorly you won't notice anything else you won't notice anything yeah. except for how terrible and how discordant the whole process is yeah. and so like big kudos to to richard because he uh he makes every issue uh read effortlessly yeah it's sure. the icing on the cake it is it, it, it really is, is. I, mean, I think i said in the last video it's just like it's a the seal of comic authenticity it or is. It, it. and people just do not appreciate it and i don't mean that like wag my finger you know it's just something that i think it's like when you watch a movie editing do you know what i mean it's like yeah. something that people don't really think about very much or or cinematography they will be swept up in the visuals but they don't realize how all those pieces kind of come together and really good coloring, really good lettering. Those are those unsung heroes, I think, of our industry, particularly since they're at the end of the production chain. They're the last people that are generally having an effect on the book before it goes to print. So they're pushed closest to the deadline. And so you're making those people's jobs harder and they have a huge effect on the on the final reading you know, process. Yeah, that's great. Be sure to check out part two of Conan's Compatriots and my conversation with Jim Zub. You won't want to miss out on details of the Battle of the Blackstone miniseries event, exclusive news on issue number four of the Savage Sword of Conan and Gary Con Fun. Thanks for watching, liking, consider subscribing, and until next time, take it easy, you stupid dogs.